Good afternoon to everybody that is joining us. Uh, my name is Marlene Orozco, and I'm excited to share the virtual stage with Teresa Razo, who is the um, owner of Via Roma, Argentine and Italian cuisine. And in this session today, we're going to talk extensively about research around the ongoing impact of COVID-19 on Latino-owned businesses. And I'm really excited again to, sh to share this stage with Teresa, who's really gonna add the human element her personal experience as a business owner during these times in navigating the pandemic and accessing relief aid. Um, so on the next slide, it gives you an overview of our agenda and the topics that we hope to cover today. So first and foremost, I would love to provide you with a, a brief background on the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative, which is where I come from, and, and the research activities in particular that happen at SLAY. Uh, then I'd like to cover our latest research findings. Um, and then I'm going to hand it over to Teresa to talk extensively about her journey uh, as it relates specifically to the data that we're going to share here today. And for the last 15 minutes or so, we're going to open it up to you all, the viewers. We would love to hear your questions as it relates to the data, as it relates to navigating relief aid um, that both uh, Teresa and I can answer together. So with that, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next slide. And I'd like to start by providing you a background on the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative, which again, we call SLAY. We're based in the Stanford Graduate School of Business in the Center for Entrepreneurial Studies. And our work is, has three main uh, thrusts, which are shown on the next slide here. So there's three main pro uh, programmatic elements. The first uh, is research, which again, I uh, lead those efforts there alongside my colleague, Inara Tarek, uh, and two faculty directors, uh, Professor Jerry Boras and Professor Paul Oyer. And uh, for the research, since 2015, we've had a national survey of Latino-owned businesses across the country and Puerto Rico to understand both the opportunities and the challenges facing this segment of the business population, which is the fastest growing in the United States, which I'll talk more about in just a bit. Second part of our programming is around education. Uh, and this education program uh, is launched in collaboration with our nonprofit partner, the Latino Business Action Network, uh, to host the SLAY Education Scaling Program. This program happens twice a year, uh, where 75 to 80 Latino entrepreneurs uh, come to the business school in pre-COVID times, it was in person, uh, for a kickoff weekend and then uh, seven week online uh, curriculum which we're happy to talk more about in the Q&A. Uh, um, and uh, I'll, t I'll share some stats about the program uh, as well. And Teresa Razo is, is an alum of the uh, SLAY Education Scaling Program. Yeah. And the third part of our programming is around ecosystem development. Um, so what we're doing is very intentionally building the ecosystem of providing education, resources, and information to Latino entrepreneurs and the organizations that support Latino entrepreneurs. So in the next slide, you see an overview uh, of the SLAY Education alumni. Um, so to date, there's over 650 alumni of this program, um, and uh, it has a very high completion rate, actually one of the highest or the highest um, for executive education programs at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, a 92% completion rate. Uh, together, the alumni generate over $3.3 billion in combined annual gross revenue, and together, uh, the alumni employ over 30,000 people across the United States. Now, this alumni base is an important part of our research. When they begin the program, we gather baseline measures, uh, and then we track them yearly thereafter to better understand the progression of their business. Um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of surveys out there that are uh, cross-sectional in nature, which means that they're singular snapshots in time. And again, we're following the same group of businesses over time. Now, this is a particular group of businesses in that they rep represent the top 3% of, of all Latino-owned businesses, uh, generating, uh, on average, uh, more than a million dollars in annual revenue. Or if you're a new company, you've secured at least $500,000 in external seed funding. Now, even at these depths, uh, success is not guaranteed. And in fact, our research uncovers a lot of challenges, particularly around accessing capital, even among the businesses that are scaled. So we can then imagine the trickling effect of those that are unscaled and not tapped into networks, which we'll talk about in just a bit. Um, so in uh, the next slide there, uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, featured our very own Teresa, 
um, who is again, an alum of the program, uh, which I'm so excited again, that she's going to share her own story as it relates to these data, um, but uh, wanted to, to tease you here on what's to come in terms of um, her story. So on the next slide, it provides a, a brief overview of our research activities. So I mentioned that we've been around since 2015 and every year we have, uh, we release a report on the state of Latino entrepreneurship. Uh, and this report, the unveiling happens in a very public way. Uh, the next one is, is happening virtually uh, at, at the end of January, which I invite you all to attend. Um, and again, we explore the opportunities and the challenges. Uh, in addition to these uh, research uh, reports, we've also created a book of readings, um, Advancing U.S. Latino Entrepreneurship, with uh, researchers and academics that are studying Latino entrepreneurs. There's not that very many of us, um, but together we contributed chapters from a variety of our disciplines. I have uh, a background, uh, a training in sociology. Um, there's contributions from econom uh, economics, women's studies, urban develop development, and a few others, which I encourage you all to take a, take a look at if you're interested in kind of digging deeper into uh, the data around Latino entrepreneurs. So on the next slide, this really kind of sets the stage for our guiding work. Um, so the next slide shows the rate of new entrepreneurs, uh, the growth trajectory of Latinos starting businesses. And what you can see here is that this growth is in fact outpacing that of all other demographic groups. Most recently in 2018, 0.51% um, of US Latinos became entrepreneurs by starting a new business, which means that out of every 100,000 Latino adults in the United States, 510 became entrepreneurs on average. Now, if we look at the last 10 years alone, um, the number of new businesses has grown 34% for Latinos compared to just 1% for all other demographic groups. So we're seeing this, this trend and, and, and this direction of upward um, uh, business starts among Latinos, which it coincides with the Latino population growth. Uh, we know that 18% um, of uh, the population, the U.S. population is Latino, and this is projected to grow to over one third by 2060. Um, but Latino population rates alone uh, do, do not describe kind of um, or, or capture the full tendency of this entrepreneurial dynamism, which we can talk more about in just a bit. Um, I'd like to switch gears now, however, um, uh, to the next slide where we're going to talk about our findings from our latest research. And the next slide shows the cover of our latest research report, the ongoing impact of COVID-19 on Latino owned businesses. You can access it there with the, the short link, the bit.ly link. Um, and these data come from uh, rapid response surveys that we've been able to administer to our panels, uh, our panels of those who participate in the, ed in the education program. And then we're also creating a research panel of a nationally representative panel of business owners, again, to understand the, uh, the impact of the pandemic over time. Uh, on the next slide, you can see that we've um, a timeline of uh, uh, the experience of business owners in the pandemic. Uh, we administered our first survey on March 25th, which was two weeks after the World Health Organization declared coronavirus a global pandemic. Um, and this was before Congress had administered any sort of relief aid. So perhaps one of the most uncertain times uh, of, of the pandemic, and we can talk more about where things are currently. Um, but then we saw the first enactment of the CARES Act, which included the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP. So this provided relief to um, small businesses. Uh, Teresa was a, a recipient of uh, uh, two PPP loans, which she'll talk more about. Um, and then we uh, uh, administered another survey again in June to see if there has been any movement or change in terms of the negative impact. You can see overall, the negative impact has remained constant. So even among those who have been able to tap into relief aid, it certainly has not been enough. And for those who did it early on enough, that money has since run out. Um, and so we're in a period right now of limbo in terms of uh, additional relief aid um, for business owners, which I'm sure many of you are, are familiar and aware. Most recently, we administered another survey in September, um, and these surveys uh, coincide with uh, external efforts as well. We, we follow the work of, of the U.S. Census Bureau very closely in terms of um, the methodology that we leverage for weighting and ensuring statistical representation, uh, which I won't get into the weeds there, but nonetheless, they administered a survey 
um, a pulse survey for about a nine week span and they're continuing these uh, again to also measure the ongoing impact. And the trend line for Latino businesses follows very closely to, to the trend line of average um, of the national average. Now these are a particular group of businesses, uh, employer businesses, which again are those that have at least one paid employee uh, either part-time or full-time on payroll other than the business owner him or herself. So this is a particular group of businesses that we're looking at, which were also then um, the group that was um, the the one that was uh, uh, the target of the PPP uh, loan in particular. There have been a series of other relief efforts which we can talk about as well in the Q&A. On the next slide, you see kind of a deeper dive of the operational impacts that are being felt by both um, Latino businesses and white white owned businesses across the board. And at the time of this survey in June, uh, I note here that um, one out of every four Latino businesses uh, experienced business closure. Um, for some, this might be temporary. Uh, Yelp recently released a report uh, where they looked at the temporary businesses, namely those in the restaurant industry, uh, which Teresa owns restaurants, so we can we can dig in there. Um, among those businesses that experienced temporary closure, they were more likely to become permanent closures. So this is something that we need to keep an eye on um, uh, and something that we'll continue to measure over time as well. The next slide shows you a distribution of, um, of uh, the negative impact experienced by businesses. Um, as uh, described or as captured by the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, and then we also look at the proportion of Latinos in those businesses. So you can see that in June, um, uh, the ac accommodation and food services industry, which is where restaurants are located, was the industry that was re reporting the largest negative impact. 70% of all businesses in this industry sector were reporting large negative impacts. Um, and there's a large number of Latino owned businesses in this sector. 13% uh, of all employer businesses are located in the sector, second only to the construction industry. So you can see a general trend line, uh, a correlation of the types of businesses that Latinos are, are located in and then what the, what the, uh, the, the negative impacts have been uh, on the, uh, as it relates to the pandemic. So beyond these industry impacts, we know that liquidity or having cash on hand, that's really going to determine the, the long-term lifespan of, of businesses under the current conditions. And as this next um, figure, as this next slide shows, um, we measured the months that current cash on hand will cover business expenses among scaled businesses, which means that they generate over a million dollars in annual revenue. And we find that even amongst this particular group of businesses, only 16% can survive by the end of the year. This means that one in six Latino owned businesses can survive this longer term with the current cash that they have on hand compared to one in four white owned businesses that can do the same. And really this lack of cash on hand, um, we, we uh, calculated can result in the permanent loss of over 2 million jobs if Latino employer businesses that say that they're strapped for cash have to permanently, permanently close before mm -hmm. the end of the year. So this immediate need for cash uh, is something that we're also paying very close attention to. And on the next slide here, I wanna now move on to talk about what has been done. Um, again, as I'm sure many of you know, the, the US Small Business Administration launched the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, and this loan aims to provide a direct incentive for small businesses to keep their workers on payroll. Um, and now many are kind of in the stage where they're navigating how to transfer the loan into a grant and be forgiven. Uh, we, we most recently heard that for those who access less than $50,000, um, it's almost automatic forgiveness. You still have to uh, uh, speak to your providers, um, but there is, they've really relaxed the, the, the rules and regulations there. But those then who have more than $50,000, uh, for some banks, the average was $70,000, we are now in a position where we have to figure out how to, to be forgiven. And what this figure here shows is a, a funnel of those who uh, requested funding, right? So mm -hmm. uh, on average, Latino owned businesses that are employer businesses applied for PPP funding at fairly similar rates to white owned businesses. But then we see gaps in terms of then who, whose funding was received. Latinos were um, half as likely to receive the funding that they requested. Um, and an even smaller amount received all of the funding that they requested. So there are some important gaps there and 
I'm sure many of you have have heard from media stories about the first wave of PPP and it going to recipients that it was not intended for. Um, and then um, the first wave, the, the funds were largely dispersed through national banks. And our research has historically shown um, that Latino business owners have more success with smaller or local banks, um, CDFIs in particular, in terms of being able to establish relationships with bankers uh, and then access the loans and, and the financing that they need to grow their business. And I, one final note I'll say here about capital is that our research has also shown kind of in pre-pandemic times that external capital is really key to scaling your company. You can only go so far by organically growing and bootstrapping your company. If you want to take your business to the next level, it's really critical to access external capital. Um, and certainly capital is critical now uh, as we face the pandemic uh, ahead. So on the next slide, mm -hmm. I do want to uh, talk now about uh, an important sign of resilience that is being uncovered in our data. So despite these challenges to liquidity and to being able to access um, relief aid, what we're seeing is that for business owners that are networked, um, which means that uh, business owners that participate in formal business organizations like chambers of commerce, like education programs, uh, such as the Slay Education Scaling Program or trade associations, our data show that networked businesses are more likely to apply for and obtain PPP funding. So it's really important to get connected and tapped into networked networks to be able to distill information, particularly in a pandemic where things are constantly changing. Uh, and then of course, business owners, uh, uh, you know, are faced with the important challenge of operating their business. Um, so to the extent that networks can distill and synthesize this information, um, they're playing a really critical role. And here, one of the highlights uh, of this large green bar that you see here is that among the Slay Education Scaling Program participants, 82% uh, applied for and successfully received their funding. Again, Teresa was one of those who applied for the PPP, and she can share, she's going to share her story uh, in just a bit. I wanna end now on this next slide before I transition to Teresa. Um, that, so on the next slide, we see uh, the distribution of businesses that are sharing or, or saying that uh, they will likely recover. So the next slide, please, shows you that um, in June, 80% of Latino owned businesses indicated that they were likely to recover. And this is uh, in comparison to white owned businesses. And similar, you know, several other studies and reports have found very similar sentiment and the importance of optimism, particularly among Latinos and other uh, minority entrepreneurs. And it is really this optimism that will continue to carry us forward as we tackle these challenges um, together. And one final thing that I'll say here is that um, our surveys again focus, or these particular set of surveys focus on employer businesses. So the story that is missing today is uh, of the self-employed individual, uh, of the self-employed individual, of the sole proprietor um, that does not have any employees um, and their ability then to, to connect and access relief aid uh, is an important part of the story, which again um, is not captured here, but we can only imagine what those impacts uh, are, are, are like. Um, so on the next slide, uh, I'm sharing my email here. Um, please feel free to reach out if you have questions as it relates to any of the data points that we shared today. Um, but now I wanna um, shift over and transition to Teresa again. I highlighted some of the experiences that we're seeing trends at the aggregate level. Let's add a human element and hear from one of our very own uh, Latino entrepreneurs, Latina entrepreneur who has her own uh, restaurants. So Teresa, the stage is yours. Please tell us a little bit about um, what your experience has been like in terms of uh, tackling this pandemic and staying afloat. Yes. Well, hi everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and honored and um, also very honored and grateful to be an alumni from uh, the Slaban. And it's amazing, all the support that we've been getting. And like you said, when you belong to a network like this, it makes a world of difference. All the calls you have a person to call you, it, it just, um, it's its either black or white. So thank you very much for all the support that you've been giving to all of us and to other small businesses and everything that you've been doing. And um, thank you to the California Hispanic Chamber of Commerce also for having us um, here and giving us a space to, to share and to see what we are really facing. 
Um, as you know, my name is Teresa Razo, and I am the owner of two restaurants and a market and deli in Orange County, California. Uh, one of them is Cambalache, is the, my newest uh, little baby that is only three years old. And Cambalache is, was born after uh, my graduation from the uh, Stanford Latino. Um, so it is part of my dream and my work that I did there. And uh, it was because of you guys that I was able to scale the other one and be able to open Cambalache. The La Roma is another one that I have, and we've had that for 15 years. Um, it has a restaurant, it has a market in Delhi. Um, both were looking into a, an amazing year. Both had uh, great plans, um, trying to scale both of them to the next level. And suddenly, of course, we all got hit by a pandemic. Um, it was just something very unexpected, as you all know, within probably less than five hour notice, you had to close down and pivot completely to only take out if you wanted to stay open. Um, nobody could eat inside. Um, many businesses were closed down because they were not considered essential. Um, everything was out there and you didn't know what to do. Um, I wanna say both and compare both of my businesses because they're in a different situation they're in a different demographic, um, and they're in, a, in also had different experiences. But Cambalache, its sales fell eighty five percent within the first the first month. So Villa Roma went down seventy percent. So when you have suddenly these two businesses and it's everything, and you have over forty two employees and families trying to depend on you, you're like, what should I do? Um, this is not working. I had to um, lay off a few of my staff that's been with us for over 10 years, but I knew at that point was going to be the best for them and just keep in contact. Thank God I've got them all back. Everybody who wanted to be back, they're all back with me um, and um, working our way through. But it was the first month the hit was incredible. We had talks about which restaurant do we save. It got that bad, um, and we even said, okay, you know, what are we going to do? The question for us, and going back to the human aspect, was not only what do we do to save our businesses. I said, we've always been a value-oriented and community-oriented business. So the question for us was, what are, the com what are the needs in the community? How can we pivot with that? So the answer to that question is how we are here and it's why we're here, and is how we've been able to, to survive. Uh, we saw the needs. That weekend when we got closed, we had, it was starting the starting of our major catering season. We had two breakfasts, over 200 each um, on the weekend. We had lunches, we had deliveries. So we had a lot of eggs, a lot of chicken um, sitting in the fridge, and we couldn't do an event. But again, the question is, what are the needs in the community? The community was looking for toilet paper, eggs, bread, and chicken. There was nothing, no meat, no nothing. I had the blessing that Villa Roma has a component of a market and deli next door. So we just were able to keep that entire portion of the business open because it was considered essential. We already had products. We already had frozen empanadas. We already had meats. We we have a, a full butcher section, <clears throat> excuse me, we have um, even wines and wine aside, drinks, uh, cans, beans, uh, imported products. So we were able to do that and just pivot it and put in everything that we had for the catering for people in, in need to take it if they needed or people to buy it if they could afford it. So we just went out and said, you know, if it's going to go bad in the fridge, might as well just have the community use it. So we went out and most of the people bought it and came out and supported. And again, going back to the networks, um, it really makes a difference. It, there's so many calls, so many um, texts, so many people saying, how can I help you? Um, let's go buy from Teresa instead of go buy to the main store. Plus there's a huge line, um, there's more risk and you can't find anything and there's more people. 
So I just started also uh, putting up in social media. Uh, friends also shared it. Chambers shared it. Um, it was just an outpouring support that we got. Um, and we continued also doing the, the takeout. And we also, we saw within a couple of weeks that so many people were being laid off. It was going to be a change. It was going to be major drastic effects in our community. So we decided to also keep looking at the uh, keep looking at the effects, keep looking at what the community needs. And um, suddenly, the stimulus plan came out. There was a lot of reading. There was a lot of nights, a lot of questions, a lot of people who I called. Everything was up in the air, like, well, we don't know, but you have to use it in eight weeks, and you have to do this, and you have to apply. Apply now. Let's hope you can get it. Um, thankfully, a great relationship with our banker at uh, Cambalache, which is Chase, and we we were able to secure that right away in the first round. Villa Roma, unfortunately, didn't make it, and then we had to wait for the second round. Villa Roma was the one that needed the most. Villa Roma is a higher operation. It has more workers. It had it's a bigger building that we have to pay rent, which is fixed rent, um, and it's a fixed cost. You can't really do anything about it, and landlords are not really being, you know, helpful. And you know, and we understand that they also have to pay their part. So, you know, it, it was a couple of weeks there too that I was very. Um, scared actually in a way of you know making sure that Villa Roma was going to make it. Finally, I reached out to the same people at Chase and they said, Well, we can't help you, but here's a name, here's a bank, here's another name, here's another small bank. Reach out to them. I reached out, um, and we were able to secure it in the second round. Tremendously helped. Um, I was able to bring some of my other staff and try to pivot different ways, explore other uh, means. Um, it was just a, it, the support there was coming from a month where you lost like 70, 75% of your sales. And then getting this, it was it was just like a miracle for me um, because I don't know how I was going to make payable the following. Um, for as much, like uh, Marlene was saying, for as much as cash you have there or cash flow that you have or cash that you can invest, uh, easily with your fixed, um, you know, payments that you have to make easily. It's done within a month or two, just with rent, you know? So it, it was a really, um, hard decision, um, moments. Even then we also had people asking, you know, or we have knowing of people who are in need shelters. That's when they started, you know, the shelters, the homeless shelters started also in need. And then we also partner with so many organizations, nonprofits, and we support them that I just, you know, vice versa. They called me and says, what do you need? And I said, you know, what do you need? And we started just working like that. And we started doing 25 meals a day for homeless shelters, then 50, then 100. And then people started to help us do more Then that 200. And then we started feeding families in need. We partnered with a school district in Santa Ana, California. And, um, you know, I think we were able to do over 17 families over a weekend and, and feed them for, I believe it was East, Easter. I can't remember now if it was Easter or Mother's Day that we did this campaign. And then we had other people donate. And they donated packages so that we can help ourselves. I can keep my staff. And we did a good thing, you know. And suddenly it grew, grew, grew in the whole network. And it's like, okay, how do we help you? How do we do this? Here they're giving this grant. Everybody, I was getting all these texts of everybody's like, here they're giving this grant. They're doing this. They're doing that. Apply for this. Apply for that. Hey, what about these family packages? You know, everybody was reaching out to me to tell me ideas. Um, and just my team was also amazing. Pivoted and said, it will be okay. Some of them said, listen, I'm okay. I can step out for three, four months and nothing's going to happen to me. So let's make sure we take care of the ones that are not in that same situation. That's how we started. Like, okay, who leaves? Who stays? 
Um, so it, it became, if I had a team, it became a stronger and closer team. Um, we make sure we take care of each other. We make sure, okay, well, you know, if I can't give you work right now, but I can give you food. As long as I have food and the providers keep bringing it, we're going to keep circling it. All I wanted was to keep the cash flow and keep circling it, being able to pay so that we can get more to give out more. Um, there was one point I, not that I gave up, but it was a lot, uh, decisions and didn't know what to do and it didn't look any good. Um, and honestly, this is the part where it's, it's something incredible. I closed down Villa Roma that night. I forgot some paperwork. I went back, um, to get that paperwork and I found myself in an empty restaurant with the chairs up on the tables. And it was something that I never thought I would see. And I did not see any light in the, you know, at the end of the tunnel. And at that point I just sat there and I remember, you know, just crying and, you know, trying to figure this out. And suddenly I started a conversation with myself, but, um, it wasn't with myself. I know it was with God, you know, conversation was with God. And at that point I realized, and, and I told God, you know, you, you haven't brought me to this point to just drop me here. I know there's a bigger thing here behind this and you know, our bigger purpose, our restaurants have always been a vehicle to really support empower and help the community. So I know that you have not brought me to this point to just drop me. So you're in control. You take over this. I will pay attention. I promise to work two or 300 wor more times than I used to work long hours. I will be aware of every single need that you bring to my table so that I can cover. And I left. And the next day, things change. It was incredible. It was incredible. Um, things change so much that we are currently um, doing 1,500 meals a day for homeless shelters. Um, we are giving away about 250 fruit, veggie, milk, and egg boxes to 250 families a week from both Cambalache and Villa Roma. Um, we're able to um, activate our Baia with a Purpose uh, program where my husband makes paellas. We sell them and all those profits go to help more people help people um, in need. We're helping his hometown little um, village where he was born. There's uh, a lot of people that are um, don't have food on the table. So we're able to help about 60 families a month there. And we started with uh, making one paella, two paellas, three, four. So now uh, uh, every last Sunday of the month and now the event and the fundraiser grew so much that we're doing about 12 paellas for that event. And when I talk about paellas, each paella serves about 60 people. So between takeouts and people coming in, picking them up, um, orders, people coming in, enjoying their paella there outside in the parking lot, it, it just it sells out and it's a huge event. And we, we are here and we are supporting others because everybody in the community is supporting us. And I just, I just think it's, um, it's, it's an incredible roller coaster where you go up and down and, you know, I decided to just enjoy the ride and stay on the positive side and use anything, all the resources that I can so that I can continue helping others and get all my staff back. Uh, PPP really did help uh, majorly for us. It was a huge impact because it gave us time to recoup from the major loss in the first month. So I knew that if I had at least a month and a half rent covered and payroll, I was able to recoup on the other things and the relationship with our vendors. That's really important. You have to talk to your, they're your best friends right there. They, I know they're struggling and some were like, we're struggling too. You need to pay us. I'm like, I'm going to pay you, but we're struggling too. So we're all in this together. So let's work something out. I worked out, not with all of them, but with some of them, I worked out plans. Okay, well, let's, the pre-COVID that you owe me, we'll do a payment plan and let's start fresh from now. 
um, grateful for that because they made us a big difference because you already had expenses of, you know, let's say one provider of twenty, thirty thousand dollars you have to pay them in thirty days and then your sales don't do that. So how can you pay them? Then I had other people, other providers say, Well here, um, you know, I had a Pellegrino that just suddenly showed up with like twenty cases of water. And it's like, Oh so who ordered this? Oh no, use it. Give it out, sell it use it so that you can help others we same with wine providers same with food providers um right now we have a huge trailer outside of villa roma um that one of our providers shamrock brought over and u.s foods to cambalache so that we can keep food and we can continue doing 1500 meals a day for the homeless shelters so that we can continue bringing those boxes in they bring us sacks of rice so that and we divide it all up so that we can give it to the family so it, it's, it's, a true, it's a true testimony of how together we can, we can do this and we can help each other out. And, of course, after that conversation, um, you know, with God and, and me having all these blessings, I had to share all the blessings. So we continue to share the blessings. Uh, we continue to that, and that is our promise. And our motto has always been never give up and always give back. And it will not change. When COVID hit, we decided we're going to open up. We're going to do what we can. If we, at the end of COVID, we have to close down and shut doors to one restaurant, to two restaurants, and at the end have nothing, that would be okay. We were at peace with that. But we were going to do it the right way, and we were going to uh, close our doors and exit the front door and um, help as many people as we could because if there's nothing I could do to save my business, then might as well just use it as the last resource as a vehicle. So that was already in our state of mind. And, but we were also going to continue fighting for that not to happen because we knew that if that didn't happen, we could do a lot more. And right now it's not about business and it's not about making money. It's about surviving and making sure everybody has food on the table. We've always been that type of um, business that type of heart, and um, there's no way we could have closed our eyes to the needs um, to the community right now. And, um, you know, it, it is um, because of God, my family, friends, chambers, network, um, everybody out there who is taking care of us, that we are standing tall and grateful and blessed and, and helping others. So... That's just a, a little bit of my, my journey in the last six, seven months. Um, it's been a, a, an amazing, like I said, roller coaster. You feel like you're on the top of the roller coaster and you're seeing things, you know, because California also had like, um, you can open. Wait, wait, now you have to close down and only patio. It's like, I was joking one time with uh, my staff. It's like, it's like, you know, when you go to, when you go to mass, like, you know, Catholic mass and you're like, stand up, you kneel, you get up, you stand, and, you know, all these changes now in the mass, it's the same thing here. You're like, okay, you can open, but wait, now you can only patio. Wait, now you can do 25%. And everything was effective immediately. So it wasn't like you have three days. Like when they opened up, they opened up on Saturday Memorial Weekend, and it was effective immediately Saturday morning. I was like, really? You're not prepared. There was no way. I did not open immediately. I took two or three weeks to put in a plan in place to make sure my staff was going to be safe and my customers were going to be safe. Because I knew we were going to have children. I knew we were going to have families there. I knew we were going to have older, um, you know, families there trying to, you know, enjoy the event and, and enjoy the food. And I, it was my responsibility to make sure. So I put this whole procedure in place and COVID barriers, because I was telling all my staff, everything you pick up from the tables has COVID. There's no questions about it, has COVID. So immediately you go through, there's everything that comes in from the customers goes through one door and everything new that comes in, sanitized, cleaned or food goes out through the other door. They can never crisscross. So I had to do a whole, you know, reinventure of my, um, um, you know, my business and how do we do what do we do and stuff? So took my time and we opened. And then like two weeks later, we had to close down again. 
So, like I said, it was a roller coaster. You're up here, you're looking at the view, and suddenly they let you down. So, just embracing it. And, um, uh, you know, I, I heard once that, you know, instead of asking the question of why is it happening to me, why is it happening for me? So, try to find out why is it happening for you and try the for. Not why is it happening to me? Because the more you're like, you know, like my conversation with God could have been, why are you doing this to me? But I was like, not. It's it's not just to me. It's like, use me. What is here for me that you can use me to help others? And also after going through the PPP, I decided to reach out to Chambers, the SBDC, and say, let's let's create awareness about this. Let's do it in Spanish too, because it was hard for me to understand the whole process and procedures and get through a bank to do this. I can't imagine others that don't have that support. So let's get it out. And that's when I decided also to turn around and instead of just concentrating in myself to concentrate and help others and um, take my other chair that I am also the president of the Fountain Valley Restaurant Association for the entire city where Cambalache is. So I also started working with the city there, which they've been amazing and secured a, a, a plan, a marketing plan so that we can help. Our, we're targeting 50 restaurants so that we can help them and um, you know, give them some support, some funding, support, marketing, help them you know, not only survive but thrive together. And we started this month with Restaurant Week for them. Next month is a, a program we call the Gratitude Month. And December, we're also working on something. And we're making noise for them and giving out, um, you know, as much as resources we can and partnering with as many people as we can so that we can make sure we, we thrive, you know, and, and we thrive together. Um, so it's, it's been a, an amazing journey. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, I felt very, very creative in the last six months because we had to. I was uh, saying I'm more creative than Walt Disney right now, you know, because we had to be very creative on what to do, how to pivot, what family needs are, families, packages, um, how to even transport things or items that you're never used to transport to to a home you know you're used to people coming to you and enjoying there but how do you take that experience and that love to somewhere else and one of the things we did was like how do we send that message that we want to thank everybody for ordering their pickup and we started just thank you notes on our packages and it, it was it was incredible the reaction of people saying oh my god i want um that pizza I had that note or you know, just anything that we could share with them and messages and letting them know, you know, what do they need? And at the beginning, we even told potatoes, onions, people are like, how much are they? I'm like, I have no idea. I've never sold them. And I honestly don't pay attention when I go to the store because sometimes I take it from my own restaurant. So it was like, well, how many do you need? I just need two potatoes. I can't find, well, here, take two potatoes. You know, you're buying all this, we'll take two potatoes. I have no idea how to sell it to you. And so we had to do another system in place and just pivot and just really, I think everybody, just the question is, how, what are the needs out there? What are the needs and how, what I do, how can we pivot to help those needs or fulfill those needs in the community? And a lot of people just did that, you know, and that was my main question. Um, and that's how we've been able to, to stay afloat. And it's not easy. We are still uh, there. We still don't know if we will have one or two or three, maybe. You never know with opportunities or none, you know, at the end of this journey. But we will embrace it. We will continue to help. We will continue to stay positive and we will continue to take care of others. So um, it, that, that's amazing. Teresa, thank you so, so very much for sharing your inspiring story. Uh, I've certainly learned so much and I hope that others have also been taking notes. 
I admire the way that you lead with community first. Uh, and I am so heartened by our Latino community who in a time of need, um, yeah. you know, there's a saying, donde come uno, come dos. Yeah. And you are living that every day. So thank you for that. And thank you for the work that you're doing uh, with your local community. Um, you know, I, I think you gave some very practical tips for our, our, our viewers in terms of establishing relationships with your vendors. They are your best friend, work things out. We're all going through this mm -hmm. together. We need to help each other out. The fact that you write thank you notes to your customers, right? They're part of our familia too. Yes. So how do we give back to them? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I am heartened by your motto, never give up, always give back. Again, yeah. you are living that every day. So thank you for that. Uh, I ended the, the data portion on this note of optimism. And despite your challenges and this whiplash, your roller coaster experience, you are still so positive. So thank you for that. I think there's a lot for us to, to learn there. Um, really entrepreneurship is a survival skill. And again, you are living that every day. You are uh, channeling your creativity, which is what mm -hmm. is needed during this time. Mm -hmm. So we have a few minutes left. We have about uh, 12 minutes here, 12, 13 minutes. So what I would love to do now is for the viewers in the audience um, who have questions, I welcome you. I encourage you uh, to take this opportunity uh, to ask either myself or Teresa any questions you have about um, navigating the pandemic as a business owner and how we can uh, be a, a support and a service to you. So as we get some incoming questions, uh, I'll pause a little bit. Uh, otherwise, I have 101 questions to ask you, Teresa, as a follow-up. <laughs> Uh, I will note as we're getting questions, and I'll get cued here that we're getting questions, um, that the PPP stopped taking applications on yes. August 8th. Uh, and I know that you're doing a lot of work locally, which is, I think, where we have to turn to, right? If we're not going to obtain federal guidance, federal direction, um, let's go ahead and, and, and do this work locally. Uh, and I think you started to talk there at the end, Teresa, about how in fact you're doing this locally. Uh, before we take this first question, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about why that is important or your efforts there on a local level? It is uh, extremely important because you are local and you depend, most of, our, most of these small businesses depend on locals. So if you don't support the other locals, there's there's no, it's a chain. It's a chain reaction. You know, like I just heard somebody, a couple of restaurants around here just closed down and I'm like, that's not good. And they're like, why is that not good? I mean, it's it because now they're losing those customers that can come to you. I'm like, no, that's not good. That's not the point. The point is that we were all okay. There's customers for everybody. That's not the point. The point is they're closing down that landlord won't have the rent for that. Those employees are not going to have a job. That person who probably put all of their dreams and money into that just lost it. I know. I know what it could feel to lose it. You know, it, it's been a roller coaster. I, it, we've, we've been through the recession uh, several years ago. We've been through uh, things that, you know, are like, okay, are we going to make it or not? You know, and um, it's, it's a tough and and if you don't have that economy going and if you don't have that resources available, then it also reflects on you because then people don't come out. People don't uh, buy. People don't have food. Um, and how can you continue that cycle? So I would say, everybody, start local. And if we all concentrate on your local, everybody's going to be taken care of. If you're all over the place, then you're going to miss somebody but if we all stay local and help each other um and then keep expanding then everybody's going to be taken care of so that's, right. that's, that's the right. idea and i can't honestly because of the time and because of funds and because of everything going on i can't go beyond that you know i'm trying to do as much as i can and i'm grateful we've never been so happy and my my husband is the executive chef in he's never been so happy to cook for so many people. It's when we, when we do the meals for, for the homeless shelters, it just like, he sometimes works 12, 15 hours a day because he has to have those meals and they have to be delivered by 1130 the next day. But he comes home and he's come 
home tired and it's sometimes we're having a snack at two o'clock in the morning and talking and it's just you go to bed and you're like gracias dios you know thank you god it's the best feeling to cook for so many people that need it and that they you know that they will have something on the table otherwise they would not have it it is just a, an incredible feeling it, it's it's amazing. We've been all over. He's been cooking all over for many, many people. And um, it's just this feeling is is incredible. Incredible. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. Um, we have some incoming questions, and I encourage others who have questions to also share them with us. Um, and we have we received two questions that are fairly similar. So I'm going to go ahead and, and ask them, Teresa. Okay. What do you see for the future of Latino-owned businesses past COVID? And has COVID taught you anything that will be helpful with your business moving forward? I recall you saying that you're more creative than Walt Disney. So what are some of the things that you are doing in terms of pivoting your business um, and kind of with your creativity that, that you see might be helpful for you uh, as we're on the other side of this pandemic? Right. Well, definitely the future for the Latino owned businesses is, is great. We are very resilient. We are strong. We are entrepreneurs from day one. If you go back to our country, what do you see in every corner? Somebody selling something. And we live off of that. Even if it's peanuts, even if it's, um, you know, fruit or whatever it is, and little fruit in, in cups, we are selling it. And we live off of that, you know? So we are very smart, very easy to, to pivot. At the beginning, I had this theory when the full um, shutdown and we could only do takeout. And I told my husband, I said, you know what? The Latino businesses are gonna thrive. The smaller businesses are gonna thrive. The bigger corporations are gonna have a harder time because by the time they get the approval to change or how we're gonna do it, and then they also have um, they also have foods that are so fine dining that you can't really put in a container and take it home. So I said, we're, we're going to drive. And we're, we're very, when you put us in a situation of less, we are more creative. Where you put us in a situation of fear or about to lose something or taking care of our family, there's something that comes out and we figure it out. Um, so I think we have definitely, definitely, definitely a, a great future. I would just say it will make it easier if we share the resources and share people what there is out there and help each other. Um, you know, don't keep it. If there's a, a grant that they're giving, I would text all the people that I know or put it up and say, here, let's all apply. And everybody's like, but that's less chances for you to get it. I'm like, we can't think that way. You know, we have to think, here it is. There's 10 of them. Maybe I'm one of them and somebody else that really needs it. I, I don't know. And if I'm not one of them, I know it's because it, something else is going to come up for me. So we have a great future. Um, we have a lot of people behind us. We are very smart, resilient, and um we can figure out things very fast and we're very creative. I've never seen anybody else be so creative than, um, you know, we can, we can do things. I mean, we needed ventilators and look from pieces that were not going to be used anymore. We created ventilators and um, it's, it's just amazing. And on the other going forward, what have I learned? What lessons? Uh, many, many, many. And every night I try to, do a journal and reflect and you know I can speak for my business as a restaurant owner we had a structure going you have to do this you have to have these you have to have bus boys you have to do this you, have to. you don't have to we can do this differently you know I realized that I didn't have to stay open till midnight to do the same impact and do the same revenue and do the same and I closed down at 9 or 10 so those two hours were, I don't want to say a waste of my time, but just, you know, 
I could have been using it somewhere else. So I manage my time. Um, it, you know that we were able to to look at takeouts and how to do events differently instead of full service and stuff, and you have to pay more staff and that you could do things differently. So it's opened up the eyes to to really think outside the bun. And sometimes when you're in the daily operation, and I encourage everybody to really look at that and say, okay, what am I doing different? And then there were things that I've been working on to do for the last year or maybe year and a half. And suddenly they were done within two weeks. Like the online ordering, I've been working on it for, for a year. And like, you got to do what you got to do. And in two weeks, I had my online ordering system going on. How can that be possible? It's because you're in that pressure that it's not longer an addition. It's a need. And it's a survival need. So it's incredible. And it taught me, like, okay, you need to prioritize what will make it a better business and a better life for you and balance it out and target those and it proved to me that I could do it in two weeks and then I was done just tackle it and um, it's just every day I try to uh, learn something new and um, I've also learned with stories of the customers of how they're thriving because they pivoted on masks or this or that or other needs and some others that lost it all like in three months you know, and I'm there like, you know, well, it's going to be okay, you know, and you see, you know, you, you learn a lot in, in life and in business. So pay attention to those little things that happen and how, how you're doing things differently now and how you can get to your um, revenue that you were before without having the extra stress. It's something, it's something very unique that I discovered. And I'm writing something about it and I'm trying to do my points and everything and keeping it because it is, um, it is uh, very interesting how you can do the same and less in the length. That's, right. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. I think we're in a moment in time where we need to embrace change and welcome these business pivots. So mm -hmm. as we're seeing a transition to these digital spaces, right? The fact that you were able to have this online ordering system up and running in two weeks, we need more of yeah. that. Um, I recall the story of, uh, you know, one of your, your cohort mates of the Slay Education Scaling Program, um, Lorena, who has uh, seven restaurants and panada shops in the Denver area. Uh -huh. uh, before the pandemic, you know, she, she was generating a lot of revenue through, um, teaching empanada making classes. Uh -huh. And of course she could no longer teach them. And so she thought she was going to lose this revenue stream. But what she did is she started to package the material that you need to make right. empanadas. And so mm -hmm. her customers would come pick up the materials, go back home and take Zoom classes and build community together while also making these empanadas. Right. So let's think creatively about how to tap into this, these digital yeah. markets, these digital spaces. Um, we're up here against the hour. We have another a question that came in. It's actually not a question and I echo this sentiment. And so I'll read it here. The, the the comment is, just wanted to say to Ms. Raso, congratulations on your success. And thank you for inspiring us Latino business owners. I am most certainly inspired and humbled to, to, to share this virtual stage with, with you and, 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 and hear your story, uh, your very unfiltered, uh, raw experience that you shared with us today. Thank you very much. Um, I share here my email again, if you would like to email me and would also like to get in contact with Teresa, feel free to email me. Uh, thank you all for uh, for viewing this session and we hope that you're able to take some, some key takeaways. Thank you. I also want to thank everybody. And of course, um, you can uh, definitely, you know, anybody who wants to reach out or wants to talk to me or anything, any questions, I'm happy and I'm available for everybody. And um, let's, you know, Thank you for this honor and it's a, it's a pleasure and let's keep working only forward only forward stay positive um even the biggest storms have an ending so we we will get this together and together we will do it faster and easier so i'm here for anybody 
I am here for anybody in, in need of a resource or in need of especially food. That's what we specialize in. Um, so we cook food for the soul and we always uh, garnish it with gratitude. And um, for all those small businesses, always remember, we might be small businesses, but we can do big, big impact. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure. That's right. Adelante, never give up and always give back. Yes. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. <laughs>